Why hello there, Dragonfly Swarm. Sumeru is here, and so are its weapons, the Tree Branch series. I'm just kidding, I don't know what it's called. But we finally have official information regarding Sumeru's craftable weapon line, and so naturally, I wanted to make a video discussing each of these weapons, who they're gonna work best for, and which weapons are worth spending your precious bil billets, billets, b billets for. I'll also discuss a bit about Tignati's bow, Hunter's Path, because it is yet another very versatile 5-star bow, just like Aqua Simulacra and Polar Star. So that'll be a topic of discussion towards the end of the video, but for now, if you enjoy this video, please be sure to like and perhaps subscribe, mayhaps, possibly, by chance. <coughs> Let's start all this off by talking about the craftable Sumeru bow, King's Squire. The bow comes with a low 454 base attack and a high 55.1% bonus attack stat, which is a teeny bit unfortunate since technically speaking, a higher base attack and lower bonus attack percent is better, but the weapon's passive does provide a hefty elemental mastery bonus when the active character casts their abilities. Just keep in mind that this effect will end when the character leaves the field or after 12 seconds, and upon ending, the passive will deal a large amount of the character's attack as damage to a nearby opponent, which which honestly is a really random and kind of weird passive. To get the most popular questions out of the way first, I don't really see this being a good enough weapon on Tignati to warrant crafting over other craftable weapons, especially not when other capable free-to-play weapons such as Prototype Crescent exist. And the really unfortunate part about that is that the weapon isn't even inherently bad for Tignati, it's just that there are other similarly accessible options that do this bow's job better. <laughs> I do see this bow being okay on Kole, but if you consider her value with Favonius bow and other supportive weapons, this weapon again just becomes an inferior option. For her time on the field, it's not entirely useless to let her benefit from the Elemental Mastery bonus, but even that won't help this weapon pull ahead of her other more useful weapons as a support character. Currently, the only other character that I would even consider running this bow with is Child, because only a few other free-to-play weapons outperform this one, but even that sounds like a copium statement, which it is, because again, an R5 prototype Crescent is just wildly better than this bow for Child, so yeah. Maybe down the line of Sumeru we'll get more characters that really enjoy this bow, but for now it feels doomed considering it's function is simply being overshadowed by basically every other free-to-play bow. Enough doom posting though, next on the list we have the Sapwood Blade, which is a very interesting 4-star sword because it now sits on top with the game's highest base attack for a 4-star sword and it's free-to-play, and it comes with a decent energy recharge bonus. On top of this, triggering dendro-related reactions will drop a leaf on the ground that other teammates can pick up to increase their elemental mastery for 12 seconds, which makes this undoubtedly without question Bennett's new best free-to-play weapon. Not only do players get easy access to Bennett's absolute highest free-to-play play buffing potential, but they also get to enjoy an easier time stacking his energy recharge and allowing him to grant his teammates an elemental mastery bonus, so it almost feels tailor-made to Bennett. So basically, if you play teams with Bennett and you don't have Aquila Favonia or Miss Splitter, there's really no reason not to consider crafting a copy of this weapon for him. As for other characters, I'd say it'll be good on Dendro Traveler as well, considering Traveler's focus on team support and their very big energy requirement as a Dendro wielder, so as much as this weapon feels tailor-made for Bennett, it also feels quite intentionally built in favor of Traveler as well. This weapon could also be quite enjoyable on supports like Jean for her emphasis on attack-based healing and her supportive nature, and that same sentiment can be applied to characters like Kuki Shinobu for her supportive nature, and even Kazuha, though I wouldn't say this weapon is going to be more valuable for him than Favonius Sword or Iron Sting, but the supportive passive and the energy recharge bonus stat make this weapon generally quite universal for supportive base sword users, and as Sumeru rolls out more characters with emphasis on EM scaling like Tignati, the value of using this sword on your supports will likely increase even further. All in all, the sword is definitely a shiny addition to the game, and it's quite exciting for free-to-play players who can now power up their Bennett's supportive buffing ceiling. Moving on to the Catalyst, the uh... What is it called? Oh, the Fruit of Fulfillment. This weapon is kind of poopy right now. Well, not that it's really poopy, but it's just that there aren't many Catalyst wielders that want this weapon because it fills a very niche playstyle and one that I'd argue only really Lisa will be able to work with. The weapon provides a decent 510 base attack with a respectable 45.9% energy recharge, and it also grants a really weird passive. The passive essentially causes the wielder to gain elemental mastery and lose attack whenever they trigger a reaction for up to five stacks, which immediately makes this a difficult weapon to work with since just about every DPS Catalyst in the game needs attack, and almost none of them have any incentive for EM scaling beyond reaction damage increases. And so, in general, those other Catalyst users either have better weapon options within a similar niche and accessibility, or just straight up don't want this weapon at all, thus leaving only Lisa and Yaimiko as potential candidates for the weapon. But the reason I'm recommending this on Lisa and not Yaimiko is because of Lisa's burst, which has a snapshot mechanic in which it will snapshot her attack stat, but not her other stats. And this means that you can cast Lisa's burst before you start going ham with reactions, and she'll snap 
snapshot her attack before it's reduced by the passive. But she'll still gain the Elemental Mastery, which is especially potent in the newly introduced Aggravate teams, Electro Charge teams, etc., where Elemental Mastery will significantly enhance her damage output, or damage contribution. It is worth noting that Fruit Basket on Lisa will generally compete very competitively with one of her best craftable weapons, Hakushin Ring, coming out on top in situations where Lisa is the main carry, falling slightly behind in some situations when Lisa is the sub carry. So while not strictly better than her other options, it does gain favor when playing her in the new Dendro teams and when running her as a driver for, say, Aggravate, things like that. And she's kind of the only character in the game right now that works in such a way that allows this weapon to be good, so that's unfortunately all there is to say about the Fruit Basket for now. Moving on to the Samaru Polearm, the Moon Piercer. I regret to inform that as of right now, this weapon is not worth crafting on <laughs> any polearm wielder. Characters like Shangling already have the catch, which performs significantly better than this weapon, and the weapon itself is most notably tailored towards Dendro-related reactions, which even further restricts its enjoyment by our current cast of characters. But I say current cast of characters because what I can say is that the very high 565 base attack, decent elemental mastery bonus, and interesting passive could make this weapon good for Sino. But I am saying this with the biggest grain of salt in history, because we don't even know if Sino is a polearm wielder. I'm just assuming he is because he's holding one in his splash art that Hoyoverse just released the other day. But that doesn't mean he is one. The assumption here is that if Sino is a polearm wielder, that would make him a perfect candidate for this weapon since he'd have access to aggravate reactions as an electro character, which benefit heavily from the elemental mastery bonus, plus he'll gain lots of attack from the weapon's high base attack and the bonus attack passive. But this is all assuming he's even made as a DPS, and I only seriously discuss confirmed and official information, so that's all I'm going to speculate about this weapon. For now, hold off on building Moon Piercer. It is questionable, but could potentially be very good. Actually, wait a minute. I just realized this could be pretty good on Burgeon Toma. Burgeon teams are a new Dendro team style in which you use slow hydro and pyro application on top of Dendro to trigger high damage Burgeon explosions, and one of the best candidates for this team is Toma. <laughs> Given that Toma is always the trigger for Burgeon, he makes good use of the elemental mastery bonus and gains some extra damage in his kit with the polearm's high base attack and attack passive. You would just need to make sure that you can invest into his energy recharge because he will need his burst to be up as often as possible. I would I would say Moon Piercer has the potential to outperform Katane as Toma's best free-to-play weapon in this team as long as you can manage his energy with Moon Piercer. And the only other free-to-play polearm that could compete with this weapon's purpose on Toma is the Catch, which generally won't help with his burgeon damage anyways, so it isn't worth comparing. Yeah, so Moon Piercer isn't totally poopy right now. That's nice. Anyways, luckily though, the next weapon is quite solid for everyone's favorite pirate. Forest Regalia is Sumeru's craftable claymore, and it comes with a respectable 565 base attack and a 30.6% energy recharge bonus, plus the weapon grants the EM bonus leaf when the wielder triggers Dendro reactions, thus making this weapon potentially a very strong free-to-play weapon for Beto, who already quite enjoys energy recharge bonuses, but beyond that, running her in aggravate-focused teams should yield quite a bit of value from the weapon's passive, allowing her to dish out some serious aggravate damage on her burst. Even despite her nature as a character who generally enjoys raw damage increases without the help of reactions. It's difficult to say how strong Beto Aggravate can be, especially considering it would depend on how many enemies are present and how efficiently Beto can proc Aggravate in any given scenario, but in small hordes of beefy enemies, Aggravate Beto with this new Claymore should be able to hit quite hard, making this weapon generally one of, if not her best free-to-play Claymores outside of Luxurious Sea Lord when you pair her with characters like Pole or Dendro Traveler. Outside of Beto though, there aren't that many characters at all that can even use the weapon, much less enjoy it. And I'd say Dory could end up liking the weapon quite a bit, considering she's an Electro Claymore user and she seems to be designed as a support, but that statement is not at all me explicitly saying this will be her best weapon, just that from what we've learned from Hoyoverse, it seems this weapon will have some merit as one of her better options. And now, moving on to, uh, this bow. End of the line really is a pretty ugly bow, and it doesn't help that it's not just ugly, but also useless. Nobody really wants this bow, but it is a free-to-play bow, with 510 base attack and 45.9% energy recharge. So there will be some merit using this as a stat stick for characters like Sara if you're really struggling with her weapon options. And I say this mostly because Sara has become quite enjoyable with the introduction of Dendro, and since she uses 4-piece emblem and requires quite a bit of energy, the weapon's stats are quite in line with what she's looking for, but the passive is still relatively useful useless outside of a marginal damage output increase. So overall, you'd still be much better off slapping Stringless or Sackbow or Blackcliff or any other 5-star bow on her, but I'd say the weapon is at least somewhat competitive with her free-to-play weapon options and could be better than Prototype Crescent since the large attack buff from Crescent requires you to hit weak points, which for Sara's playstyle is a bit too risky to try. In general though, this bow suffers from kind of the same issue as King Squire in that it tries to fill a niche that's already filled very well by other free-to-play or accessible bows, so it's going to be very difficult 
difficult to recommend this weapon on any character, especially since you have to waste your time fishing to get it. And to top this whole video off, let's talk about the new limited 5 star bow, Hunter's Path, which is yet another very versatile and quite powerful bow. We already know it's catered heavily towards Tignati, so I won't discuss why it's so good on him in this video, but I will discuss who else this weapon is good on, starting with Ganyu. This weapon is quite insane for Melt Ganyu, and it will generally perform very competitively with, if not better than Amos Bow, which is her signature weapon, by about 3-4% to 4 to be exact. Considering you can throw a bunch of free EM bonuses on Melt Ganyu using Bennett with 4-piece instructors and Sapwood Blade, plus Sucrose on her A4 passive, it's quite easy for Ganyu to lean into Melt Damage and the Hunter's Path weapon passive without sacrificing her ability to build a very large crit ratio thanks to the weapon's 88 crit value. Thus, overall, it will generally become her best in slot in Melt Teams, even beating out Amos Bow and the similarly competitive Aqua Simulacra. Hunter's Path will also be quite a strong weapon on Yoimiya, although not as strong as her best in slot. Thundering Pulse will still have quite the edge over Hunter's Path, but in terms of Yoimiya's second best options, Polar Star, Aqua Simulacra, and Skyward Harp, Hunter's Path is competitive with these weapons on Yoimiya and should sit somewhere in between these three as one of her better 5 star options. Outside of those two characters though, you can expect the weapon to be quite good on Child, and it'll be especially interesting to see how strong it becomes on him with his newfound emphasis in Bloom teams and his already established enjoyment in other reaction teams, although I wouldn't say this weapon is better on him than Polar Star, simply because Polar Star has a higher base attack with only slightly less crit rate and an attack bonus passive that applies to his entire kit. But yeah, in general with Hunter's Path, it's going to be quite a versatile weapon for every GPS bow user simply because it's a massive stat stick, much like how Jade Cutter just works well on any sword user, or how Aqua Simulacra does on bow users as well, etc, etc. While there will be differences in value based on the character and what their best bows are, you can generally expect this weapon to be a very solid top option on any of them, and thus, if you're okay with the weapon banner, it's not a bad bow to consider pulling for if you thoroughly enjoy any of these characters. But that about sums up the Sumeru weapons guide, well, the, the initial guide. Things will likely change as we learn more about the intricate details of Dendro, so I'll keep my pinned comment open for updates on any of the info in this video if need be. But for now, if you enjoyed this video or it helped you in any way, please consider liking and subscribing as it very much helps my channel, and also follow me on Twitch because I am live right now pulling for Tignory. Wish me luck. I'm gonna go continue pulling. <laughs> <laughs>